hide it better. Huh? Or we'll hide it better. Telling everybody's going for BYOD. Um, um, well, you know, it's all VIOP now. You know, all the phones on campus, they're all VIOP. Um, it's not like I use my phone for anything. I mean, it's just sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so how many people have got a chance to look at the homework assignment and at least you know, take a first crack at it? Okay, so what do you think? Still got a long way to go. A long way to go, okay. What about the rest of the class? Yep. And I don't know if you're gonna answer it, but the uh, max length constant, mm -hmm. how do we get that 32, the value into a register, or are we doing that? Well, we really have only talked about a few um, operands. So we got immediate, we got indirect, and we have register. So you know, you obviously need a move instruction because you're copying from the first to the second operand. Okay. So the second operand has to be the register operand because you're trying to copy or you're changing you're changing the content of a register. So you only got the first operand to select. So you have immediate, you have indirect and you have register as choices <coughs> for the first operand. So which one do you think will put a constant into Would a register? It if we treated it like a label? Well, it is a label is nothing more than a symbolic name of a value, of an integer value. So is this so the same thing, basically? As L1, yep. L1 okay. is a label, right. and max length is a label as well. It's just that you know, L1 cannot, you don't know the exact value because the linker is responsible to actually come up with the value of L1, but in the case of max length, you can, since I define it to be 32 or whatever I want to define it to be, so the assembler knows, you know, max length is really just 32 in this case. So is it scope just in that file is the difference? That is correct. Oh, okay. Yep. You can, you can export it to, if you say dot global max length, then the linker will know about it, and if somebody else wants to refer to max length, you know, then it will also be resolved. Right. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. So what we'll do today is I'm going to give myself a in-class homework assignment that has something to do with your actual you know, assignment. So I will start with something you know that is uh, that is similar to what you have to do, except you know it, the complexity is not as much. Okay. So I will start with a. Uh, String length, okay, S T R L E N, which is a C function to determine the length of a null terminated string or array of characters. <coughs> so that's what we'll do today. You know, is basically just one long experiment or you know session to write some program, and I will show you the steps that I will take to get this done. And you know, you can certainly try to do it. You know, in any way you want. Okay, you know, so I'm not saying that the way I do it is the only way you should do it. Um, the end result is you, know, you have to get it done. I mean, your homework assignment has to work you know, according to the description. So I'm going to make a folder called string length here and put my code into here. So the first thing I would do is I would write a C program to do it first. Okay? I'm not going to start with assembly code right away. I will start with regular structured C code. And then I will do it step by step to convert it into assembly code. That's what I would do. So I would do it as you know, string length dot cpp or dot c. You know, since it's not going to use any actual C plus plus feature, I'm just going to use a dot c extension here. Um, okay. So I will use you know, my own string length. So I will say tax string length. Okay. Just so that it doesn't confuse with the actual string length string length you know a function in the C library. Um, const char pointer. And we'll call this str for the string. Okay. So how do you determine the length of a string uh, that is null terminated? You start from the very beginning, and as long as what you're seeing is not a null terminator, you keep moving and keep counting up. Okay. So that's one way to do it. And that's also you know, what, what I'll do here. So I will use you know, a particular variable in the function called length here. Um, and I can initialize it to zero right away. And I have a loop that says, you know, as long as what str pointing to is non-zero, uh, I'll do two things. The first thing is to increment uh, the length itself, meaning that I'm adding one to the length that I'm counting, the number of characters. And then the second thing is to increase the pointer itself by one 
so that I will be pointing to the next byte. So the next time I go back to the while statement, I'll be comparing that byte with zero again uh, to see if I am seeing another byte. Um, and then after that, I would do a return you know, length here. So don't worry about how to deal with parameters or return values in your program because you are not writing a subroutine. You are putting your logic directly into the program itself. There's no calling of a subroutine, so you don't have to worry about, oh, how do I pass parameters? How do I return a value? You just have to focus on the middle part, which is the logic of the program. And I'm going to make this a little bit more friendly to the conversion later on. So instead of using uh, the initialization when I declare, I will have a separate initialization. So this way, you know, it will be easier to convert into assembly. <coughs> <laughs> so the next thing I'm going to do is to you know, give it a test case, right? I mean, I have to you know, uh, generate the test case here. There are several ways to do this. Um, I'm just trying to think about you know, the best way to do it. I'll do it the uh, slightly harder way, okay? The slightly harder way, which some of you should already know how to do, is to use the parameters from the command line. When you run any program in you know, at least you know, any command line program in Linux or Unix, uh, they always have the ARGC or the argument count and all ARGV, which is the actual an array of pointers to strings and they represent the arguments that you're passing on the command line. Okay? So I'm just going to show you, you know, a little bit of how to get this to work because it's going to be useful anyway. Okay, so I would say you know, if ARGC is at, is not at least two. Uh, don't bother to do any processing, and just exit with a code of one. You know because it is not a normal exit code because you know I'm expecting at least one more thing. And if it has at least two, then I'll just kind of move on and use the second argument. The first argument is the command itself, so it's, that's not what I want to use for processing. The second one is okay. The second one is the actual string that I want to find the length of. So with the second one, I can now do this. I can just, uh, let's see, I'm going to use an integer here. So I, in, the G, in GDB, I can now test it. So I can say x equals to tax string length, and I will pass it whatever argv, uh, the second argument of that array. And I'll pass it to uh, the subroutine to determine you know, x. Um, I'm not going to do anything about x here. I'll return right away. <clears throat> so this program really doesn't do a whole lot um, if, unless I run it in GDB. If I run it in GDB, I can put a breakpoint on return zero in the main function so I can <coughs> actually test the value of x to see whether it figures out the correct uh, length of that string or not. Are we doing okay so far with this program? So once again, you know, I just want to, you know, this part is definitely out of the scope of this class. ARGC tells you how many components the command line was started off with. It has at least one component, which is the command, the command itself. So when you say your dot slash, in this case, uh, string length, and press the enter key, that will be at least the first and only argument to main. Okay? The second argument, or the second parameter of the main function, ARGB, is a pointer to a pointer to a construct. But the other way to look at this is an array of strings. Okay, as an array of strings, the first item in this array refers to the first component in the, on the command line, which is just the command itself. So if I want to pass additional commands or switches to the command, those would be like the second, third, and so on, you know, uh, components of ARGB, right? So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and compile this program, run it through GDB, and see if it works the way it's supposed to. So we'll use GCC-G, which includes debug information. Uh, I personally like you know, dash uh, wall, which is actually warn all. Okay, the uppercase W is controlling the warning messages, and all means you know, give me warning of everything. And then I also usually include pedantic, which uh, means you know, uh, it will complain about any compliance issues. So I have to be completely NCC compliant, otherwise it will generate uh, warning messages for me. Uh, dash O to specify the output file, the executable in this case. I'll just call it string length here. And then last 
is the source file, which is strlen.c. And it gives me some complaint, implicit declaration, okay, because exit is not uh, included, variable x set but not used. So it's complaining about certain things, you know, that is, well, it kind of makes sense in general. Exit is a, a function, but since I'm not including you know, the .h file, um, the C compiler doesn't like it because it doesn't, it says, well, I don't have a prototype of exit. I'm not sure what kind of parameter it's supposed to take and what kind of value it's supposed to return. So that's why I have to use a standard lib.h as an include file just to make the compiler happy because it, then it knows you know, how to use exit as a function call. Uh, the other one <coughs> is about this line here because the only time I use x is to put a value into it, but after I put a value into x, I never really use it, okay? And the compiler figures it out and go like, well, why are you doing this? Okay, you're putting something into x, but you never really use it afterwards. Okay, well, that's an error that I can live with. To make that error go away, I can try to trick the compiler and say, yes, I am doing something with x, and see if it, you know, it would let me go without the warning. So let's try GCC again, and this time it got fooled and thinks, oh, okay, that's good. But in reality, I really didn't do a single thing with X. Is that okay so far? Okay. <clears throat> and I can go into GDB to test this program, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll set a breakpoint. Let's see, where should we set a breakpoint? Uh, we can set a breakpoint on line 24, okay, because by that time X <coughs> should have the value of the length already. And when we run this program to pass a parameter to the program itself, I would say R and then the string that I want to find the string length from, okay. So if I just say ABC here, then ABC becomes ARGV square bracket 1, which is the second item in ARGV, which is the parameter passed to main. Is that okay? All right, so I'm gonna run the program like this. In fact, I will put one additional breakpoint on line uh, eight, 19 first. So put a breakpoint on line 19, it's just so that we can examine what is ARGV and ARGV. So this way you kind of know, have an idea of what they are. Um, and we are going to run the program with ABC as the argument to the program itself. And now we are stopping on line 19. On line 19, because this is a GDB and the program was a, is a, a C program, I can now say, okay, what is ARGC? ARGC is two, which means there are two components on the command line to start this program's execution. Does that make sense? The first one is R, the second one is ABC, okay? So now I can look at ARGV and find out you know, what it looks like. So I can say print ARGV. It only tells me it is an array of pointers. So what I can do instead is I can say, okay, show me the first one. And the first one is the command itself. Um, this is the entire, this is the full path to the executable itself. So that's why I toss it away. The first one is not useful to me. But what about the second one? ARGV bracket one, that's ABC. All right, so are there any questions about the program up to this point? Up to this point, it has nothing to do with assembly language programming, but I think you know, some of you may be slightly curious, okay? How does this you know, program know about the command line options you know, that is passed to it? This is how. Has anyone kind of ever thought about you know, how do I get all the parameters on the command line? No one? Because nobody used the command line at all. Okay, well, this is how it's you know, done. Um, so our focus is the string length you know, uh, subroutine. So I will just continue execution, which will go through string length and come back with an answer. It will be stored in variable x in main. And it did not. So probably have a stupid mistake somewhere. Yep, the comparison is in the wrong direction. If it is less than two, it is an error and go away. <clears throat> All right, so recompile GDB and run it with, put a breakpoint. Put a breakpoint on line 24, run the program with ABC as its argument. And this time it, we get to line 24, which breaks on line 25 because line 24 is optimized out of it. So at this time I can print X and it's three. 
Is that correct? It's the length of the string ABC and then a node terminator 3. Yep, okay. So the program does what it's supposed to. So this is my starting point, okay? You know, my starting point is just a C program. The next step is to flatten the C program, okay? Now what do I mean by flattening a C program? To flatten the C program means instead of using structure code, which is a while loop, I will convert it into a flat program, which means it only makes use of conditional go-tos and unconditional go-tos. And in the condition of the go-tos, it will only be a simple comparison. Okay, so that's how it will flatten this, flatten this program. Before you flatten the program, it might be helpful to you know, copy the original program, which is proven to be working at this point, to a different file, just, just for simple version control. Okay? It's not the proper way to do it, but it is the you know, easy way to do it. All right, so now that I have a backup of this program, I can now start to make changes to it. The question is, how do I get rid of the while and replace it with just conditional go-tos and unconditional go-tos? Did we talk about that last time? We did, right? Okay, so if you go back to topic five, and I can actually get to see you know, who clicked on these links and who did not click on these links. I have not done it yet because I don't have time to do it. Um, but if I need to, I can actually tell you know, who actually went back and studied the notes and you know, who did not. All right, so getting back to here, to see control structures, we are dealing with a pre-checking loop, and this is how we do the conversion. So I would put it side by side so I can just kind of copy from my own you know, method of doing things here. So in this case, what I'll do is I'm going to say, okay, let's comment this out so that it becomes, you know, in fact, is not used anymore. And this is one way to do it. Um, the traditional way of commenting, which is using either slash star and then star slash, or slash slash on each and every single line, it works okay, but it cannot, it's not easy to cut out a chunk of code, you know, in just like that. This can cut out a chunk of code just like that. It is a CPP feature, or C preprocessor feature. Uh, it is a conditional statement, but it is only to the preprocessor. So in this case, it is, it is saying if pound if zero, and since zero is false, it's, it's going to say, OK, skip everything in between all the way up to pound and if. That's what it's doing with the CPP, or the C preprocessor. Um, you can do it this way. Uh, and then we can use a pound else here to basically say, okay, but what is the alternative to getting this stuff done? So we can now say the alternative. The alternative looks kind of like this. We have one label to mark the beginning of the loop, one label to mark the end of the loop. Whatever this condition is, we'll flip the condition, and then we'll go to the exit point if the negation of the stay in loop condition is true. Um, and then we have the body of the loop, and then at the end of the body of the loop, we have an unconditional branch all the way back to L1, which is the beginning of the while loop. So we'll do exactly that, follow this pattern here. I would not use L1 and L2 as generic you know, label names, so I would just you know, use a more you know, better selection of names here, like while begin and while end. So while begin takes the place of L1, while end takes the place of L2, and then the conditional statement in here is the negation of str you know, dereference go to while end, and then in the inside I have block one, which is you know, length plus plus, and string plus plus, and then at the end of this I have a go to back to the beginning of the loop, which is the label while begin, like so. Okay, so that's what I mean by flattening the program, okay? This is the first step of flattening the program, by removing the while loop, and replace the while loop with um, a simple conditional go-to. Is that okay so far? Okay, yep. Yeah. No, this is just my way of commenting this chunk of code and replacing with this chunk of code. Now, the reason why I do it this way is because if I ever need to switch back to the original code, all I have to do is to turn this zero back into a one then it will use the original code instead of the, instead of the alternative. So if the program doesn't do what it's supposed to, I can say, oh, if I mess up in the original code, then I flip that zero on the count if line to a one, 
I can retest the program using the original code. If that works, that means you know, my translation, my attempt to flag to the program is the faulty part of the process instead of the original program is faulty. So this gives me a quick and easy way to flip between the original code, which is structured while loop, and the flattened program, which does not have any structured code at all. Is that okay? Sort of? Maybe. Okay. All right. So given this is what I want to do. Yep, go ahead. No, no, thank you. Are you good? I'm, I'm good. Okay. All right. I was kind of struggling with that um, for, the, um, for the homework. The flattening part? No. When you, when you, um, when you put P1 plus plus, yeah. P2 plus plus. Okay. Well, that's increment, right? So to, okay. I'll, I'll do this step first. You know, I'll do it one step at a time. Okay. So now we have the new string length. And mm -hmm. you know, we'll use GCC to recompile it, GDB to rerun the program. So GDB string length. And let me find out where to put the breakpoint. Line 33 would be a good one. So now I rerun the program. Um, oh, run ABC. I forgot the parameter. So I print the value x, and it's still figuring out the length here correctly. Now with this one, you can also, <coughs> you know, you can go to uh, list. Um, tax string length. So with this one, you can also put a breakpoint into the code here, into the flattened portion of the code, just like on line 16, just to make sure that we did get to line 16 and not use the original code. So in this case, I can run the program again and use ABC again, and now it is stopping on line 16. So I'm pretty sure I'm using the flattened per, uh, version of the code and not the original code at this point, because otherwise the debugger would not be able to stop here. Is that okay so far? Okay. So. I have a question about GDB. Uh huh. Um, when you're doing breakpoints for uh, subroutines, mm -hmm. and you load that up from there, but you it, it just whatever you put it with the previous thing you loaded up, it has the relative line numbers for, as opposed to the. Well, it seemed like when you loaded up uh, tax string length, mm -hmm. the, the the line numbers reset themselves. Mm. Yes, because when I say list and then I give it the name of the subroutine, right. it goes so to... So if I were to say breakpoints 10 on that, we uh -huh. would do relative line 10, not 10 of the full program. It is always line 10 of the full program. You cannot do a relative from the beginning of a subroutine. As far as I know, so that cannot be done. So the benefit of just, just for reference purposes, line numbers in the subroutine? Um, but these are line numbers for the entire file. These are not line numbers in the subroutine. Oh, so then, okay, okay. But I made a mistake. I thought it was relative. No, because you, know, you can see the pound include still has line one. Got it. Yep. All right. So as far as <coughs> I know, this program is still okay. You know, so I would do another copy of the source code to string length two in this case. Now, in reality, you want to learn how to use RCS, CVS, uh, GET, or you know, one of those other tools for revision control um, because it's a great, you know, it's something that you really need to know before you get to work anyway. And it, really, it, it is helpful for your homework assignment so you can keep track of versions or revisions of your program. Every time you do something and you prove it is working correctly, you should check it in, quote unquote check in the program, just so that you have a version of that program um, while it is at least partially functional. Okay, so now we can go back into here and say, well, we're not quite done yet. Because even though the program is flattened, it is still using a negation here. So we want to get rid of the negation. Not star str means as whatever str, which is a pointer, points to, is, um, is a zero. Okay? This expression is true when whatever str points to is a zero. So to get rid of the negation is easy. Because now we can just replace the negation here with a comparison to zero. It means exactly the same thing. Is that making any sense? Okay. So I'm just going to do it this way. And you can see that it is now getting closer and closer to what we can do in assembly. Can we compare? Can we compare to zero? Can we dereference? Okay. So all of those things we can do already. We have uh, mechanisms to do, do all of those things. What about you know, length plus plus? Well, length plus plus. It's the same thing as length plus equal to one. 
Can we do that in assembly? Can we add one to some kind of length? Okay. Can we do this to str, the pointer itself? Okay. Um, so we are almost done. Okay. So with this revision, I'm going to retest the program just to make sure that you know, it is still working correctly. So we gdb str length. <coughs> And we put a breakpoint on line 33 again. Run the program with A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay, so this time it should be 6 instead of 3. And X, it is 6. So the program is still working. So that means, you know, this is as far as I can take it just by flattening the program. Okay, and the focus of your homework assignment is really just this part. Okay, how we pass parameters, don't worry about it. How do we return a value, don't worry about it. Well, not at least for now. Um, but this is our focus. How do we translate just this part of code into assembly? That is your next task. Okay. The nice thing about doing it this way is the flattening part is all done in C, which means you know it's easy to debug. Okay, because we all <coughs> we should all, all know C well enough to do something like this. And you can run it through GDB. You know, GDB is aware of C types. So a pointer is interpreted as a pointer, and integer is interpreted as, a, as, a, as an integer. So this part has nothing to do with assembly language programming, except for the flattening, the, the process of flattening this program is the first step that you have to do before you translate this code into assembly. Are we still doing OK so far? OK. So now the question is, how do we get this program into an assembly language program? Okay. Because you know you're going to start to do some the same thing with uh, string and copy. Well, string and copy is a little bit more complex, but nonetheless, I gave you the C code already, so you can do the same thing, you know, using the same approach with your homework assignment. Okay. So the next step for me to do is to copy string length C into string length S, which is the assembly code. Now, obviously, it's not going to assemble because it is not assembly code. So what I'll do here is I'm going to cut out stuff that I don't really need anymore. Okay, so I'm going to cut out all of this stuff here that I don't need anymore. Main, I don't need anymore either. So what is remaining here is really just the core part that I need for my assembly code. And then the next thing I would do is to put a pound sign in front of every single line so they're all considered comment. So this won't interfere with the assembler anymore. So given that, now I can say, well, you know, how do I use you know, length in assembly? Well, let's not worry about that first. Okay? So what we'll do is to say, okay, here's start, global start, start is here. Um, I did not tell you, you know, how to uh, keep track of length. I only tell you that you know, by the time your program exits, you know, it has to give me the, the value. Did I say which register? EBX. Hmm? EBX. EBX? For the zero, one, or negative one. Okay, so EBX you know, needs to have the, the, the value. So in this case, let's just say you, we use the same standard. Okay. So just so that it's resembling your homework assignment. So I'll just say that EBX should have this result of string length i line. Okay, so that's, you know, I'm just reminding myself to put the result into EBX. Um, so instead of using a variable length, I can just use, guess what, EBX in place of length. Okay, because I just need a way to keep track of the length and the result is supposed to be EBX, so I might as well just use e EBX you know, for that purpose. Okay. So if that is the case, then I go back to here and I say use EBX as my length. Okay, now given that I'm using EBX as my length, how do I initialize length to zero in assembly? Move, zero to Move dollar zero to EBX. Okay? All right, very good. So that would replace you know, this line in C. Okay, that's, that's not too bad. What about this line here? How do I define a label called um, while begin? Same one, okay? So since it is the same, I might as well just receive and remove the comment so I can keep the code in assembly. And the same thing with while end. The definition of a label is you know, pretty much the same way. 
Okay, so that's pretty easy. I'll take care of all the easy stuff first, okay? Um, knowing that EBX is my length, how do I add one to length? Well, length is already EBX, which is a register. Add one to EBX. Yep. Add long, dollar one to EBX. Okay, so that will do. So add long, dollar one to EBX. Okay, so what is not done yet is STR, okay? The pointer to, that points to a particular character. Um, it is not initialized here <coughs> because, you know, well, we don't even know where that stuff is supposed to go, right? In your homework assignment, there's a data section. So in your homework assignment, there's a dot data section. And in, in the data section, we have STR1, which is label of a dot fill 32, which basically means you know I'm allocating 32 bytes, initialize those 32 bytes to 0, and have the first byte out of those 32. The address of that is also known as STR1. Okay, That's what this particular line is doing. So what are we going to do with STR, which is the pointer? Okay, STR1 is the label of the beginning of the entire array. STR in this code is the pointer. How should I initialize this pointer? Well, since we are copying, we know it's going to be a move L. And the starting point of the entire array is STR1, so we are copying that to the pointer, which is STR. Now, instead of using a, you know, another location in memory to keep track of the pointer, you can use one of the registers as a pointer. Okay? We have EAX all the way up to EDX that we can use for free. Um, so why not use one of those for STR, you know, for STR, the, the string pointer? So I'm going to use EAX in this case. You can use ECX or EDX. It doesn't matter which one you want to use. So just pick, pick one of the registers to become STR in this particular program. And I'm going to leave myself a comment here and say you use EAX as STR the pointer. Okay. So from here on, I'm using EAX instead of STR in the original C code. So I will take care of the easy one first. How do I add one to a uh, character pointer? Just add one to the register that is taking the place of STR. Are there any questions about this step? Okay, there are no questions about this step? Okay. Uh, what about the go to? That seems like uh, something that I can probably take care of at this point. A go to is an unconditional go to, and we have a jump instruction that is also unconditional, and we just go to the same label. There we go. So the only difference is you know, replace go to with JMP and get rid of the semicolon because we don't need the semicolon. Okay, so it's for the most part done. Okay, for the most part. The only part that is not done is this step here. Hmm, what are we comparing here? We are comparing zero not to STR, the pointer itself, but to what the pointer is pointing to, okay? Because in the C code, it is dereferencing STR first, and then it compares to the byte that STR is pointing to. And in this code, we are using EAX instead of um, STR, and EAX is a register already. So is there, are there any easy way for me to get to um, the byte that a pointer is pointing to, that a register is pointing to? Is there a addressing mode that I can use for this? Indirect. Indirect, okay, and what does it look like? Parentheses around a register, very good. So we know it's a compare, okay, so we have CMP, um, what are we comparing? Are we comparing 8-bit stuff, 16-bit stuff, or 32-bit stuff? Yep, because STR point. Go ahead. 4-bit? 4-bit? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, the good thing is you're all using powers of 2. So that, that part is good. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged. Um, okay, STR is a pointer. And I'm comparing what it points to to zero. What what type of stuff is STR pointing to? Is a it's a char pointer, right? 
So if it's a char pointer, whatever it points to is how, what is the width of the thing that it points to? What is a char? One byte, okay? And am I comparing the pointer to zero to see if, it, it's to see if the pointer itself is null, or am I, am I comparing what it points to is null? First or second? second? The second case, so that means the comparison is gonna need what kind of width? Byte, okay, so compare byte, a bit. Okay, so we have a CMPB in this case. So we are comparing bytes. Um, the first operand is the only one that can be immediate. So we have to use that one for immediate. Um, the second one is whatever STR points to. But since STR is in EAX already, we can use the indirect operand, which is per, uh, in parentheses, uh, percent EAX, close parentheses. So in this case, I'm kind of lucky because I can use a single compare instruction to do this. Now, in your case, when you're comparing two memory locations, it won't work because you cannot have two memory operands in the compare. So what you would need to do is to move the byte into a register, into an A-bit register, and then uh, have a second compare instruction to deal with the compare. So you need a move byte and then a compare byte after that to accomplish comparing a location in memory with another location in memory. But in my case, I'm just kind of lucky because I, you know, I have the ability to compare immediate in this case. All right, so if it is zero, I want to go to while end. So how do I formulate the conditional branch in this case? Which flag should I pay attention to? We, we only got like five flags, including the makeup flag, L. So we have the carry flag, we have the Z flag, the zero flag, we have the overflow flag, we have the sign flag, and then we have the make believe flag, which is the L flag, the less than flag. So which flag should I pay attention to when, the, when I just want to know, is it zero or not? Zero. The zero flag, exactly. So we say J, Z or J, N, Z in this case. J, Z, yep, because the polarity of the comparison is indicating this is indicating what flag I should be using and whether it should be negated or not. So if it is zero, I want to get out of the loop, which means I want to branch to our <coughs> end, which is actually indicated here. So now I have the entire code pretty much written. And what is left to do is to you know, come up with the exit code here. The exit code is just moving $1 into EAX and moving well, since the result is in EBX, I might as well just use that for exit. So, all right, so here's my you know, assembly version of string length. I'm not really sure whether it's gonna work or not. Oops. So we'll give it a try, okay. <laughs> Do a link. GPB string length, like so, all right. Not doing it. Okay, compile. Can't find any code section. Oh, okay, I think I know why. I forgot to do one thing. I forgot after this, I forgot to switch back to dot text. That's why. There we go. Reassemble, relink, re GDB. This time we read all the symbols. We can list the program. So do you guys want me to kind of trace this through or do you want to say, okay, let's just run it all the way to the end and see if it works. Okay, let's run it all the way to the end. Okay, so if I just run it all the way to the end, what do you think should be the exit code of this program? EBX is the exit code. So without doing anything else, okay, um, what do you think this program should give me as a result? It is not a segmentation fault. I surely hope it's not a segmentation fault. Um, what what is this? What is the length of this? What is the string that I'm trying to figure out the length of? Oh. As it is now. Okay. It's well. It is zero. not exact. Exactly. Okay. Is it? Is all zeros right? So if an array is all zero bytes, what is the length of that string? zero, right? Because the first byte is a null terminator already, 
So the length of that string should be a zero. So EBX should be zero. So when I run this program all by itself without doing anything, anything else, it should come back with a, a result of zero. The exit code itself should be zero. EBX should be zero. Okay. So let me just set a breakpoint first, just to be you know clear on break. I'll break on line 27. So by that time, EBX should be zero, and the program should not be an infinite loop. Um, it should definitely not uh, do a segmentation fault or anything like that. So I run the program, and at this time I want to print EBX, and it is a zero. Great, the program works when it is a null string. So the question now is how do we test it with an actual string, okay? How do we alter memory locations so that we actually have a string here that is non-zero? We can use set, okay? So we can set var, set variable, um, exactly where, what location are we setting and how we should set it. There are several ways to do this. In the homework assignment description itself, I you know, kind of gave you a hint of how to do this. So let's go back to the homework assignment description first, just so that you know, we know where to find all this stuff. So in here, I basically give you this instruction here. Okay? So assuming n is the position in string one that you want to change to x here, this is the command to do it. So let me try my own command and see, make sure that it works. Okay, so we basically say dereference the pointer, but the pointer is casting the address of str1 because of the compiler. I mean, uh, GDB has a slight misunderstanding of what str1 is, and then we add the offset. So let's say we deal with the first byte, which has an offset of zero from the beginning of the entire array, and we can set it to let's say lowercase a. Okay. And how do we check to see this is actually done correctly? The X command can do it, right? So we can now say, you know, let's, uh, let's look at uh, four bytes individually and look at those as characters because we're dealing with a string here. And starting at the address of str1. And sure enough, we have a letter A which has the ASCII code of 97 in decimal and then the next byte is a null byte, which is a zero. So that's one way to uh, basically come up with a string to test your program. It is very tedious because every byte has to be set individually. There's no easy way to say, oh, initialize this entire array to this array here. There's no easy way to do that. But there's an easier way to do this. If I want this to be um, uppercase ABC with a null terminator, I can also do this, which is actually extremely confusing why it works. That works too. Okay, before I explain why it works, let's double check to make sure that it does work and then I'll explain why it works, okay? We re-examine the four locations starting at label str1 and sure enough it is now ABC followed by a null terminator. Now how does that work? Okay, now GDB tries to be smart, okay? That's what it's trying, it's trying to do. And labels coming from assembly and assembly language program has no type associated with it, okay? A label is nothing more than saying, oh, when you see this symbol, it is the same as this particular value. That's all it's saying. It doesn't say whether it's an address, whether it's the address of an integer, or an address of an array of characters, or anything like that, okay? Dot field has absolutely nothing to do with um, the type of str1. So str1 doesn't really know what it is, except I'm a number, okay? GDB, on the other hand, wants to be smart. So when you just say, you know, set bar and then use a label name equal to something, GDB says, well, nobody tells me what str1 is, okay? Um, so I'll try to be smart and default to an integer. So it will default to the interpretation of str1 is the address of an integer. So when you say, you know, set var str1 equals to something, it will just say, oh, I'll pretend that str1 or whatever is at str1 is an integer, a 32-bit integer. Is that okay so far? Okay, so this is not something by design, okay? It just so happens that GDB, you know, tries to be smart and want to interpret str1 as an integer. Okay, now, Understanding this um, as an integer, as a 32-bit integer, and using little endian, the interpretation of little endian, 
what is the byte sequence of you know zero x zero zero four three four two four one? Which one is the first byte? Four one is the first byte, and four one in hexadecimal turns out to be the ASCII code of uppercase A. Okay, and then four two is B, four three is C, and then the most significant byte zero zero is my null terminator. So this is one kind of tricky way to initialize the string using it, you know, using the form of an integer. Now, I understand you know, this may look like, oh, this is just a nifty trick, I don't need to know this. You do. Because this is basically telling you how to look at memory locations. In assembly language programming, there's no default interpretation. A byte is nothing more than just a byte, eight bits, that's all. So whether you look at a byte as a part of a 32-bit integer, as a single byte, or whatever, it doesn't really matter. The debugger can do that, but your code doesn't really you know, matter at all. So even though I initialize string as if it is an integer, when I run the program, it is still gonna use the same way of interpreting these individual bytes and should come up with the correct value in EBX. In this case, what should EBX be when the algorithm is done? Should be three, right? Okay, so let's run the program from the beginning. And I'm not sure whether I do, if, if I do this, whether it will reset the memory locations. So let me put another breakpoint first on line 27, just to be sure. I'll put a breakpoint on line uh, 10 actually in here. So I'll rerun the program from the beginning, but I'll have to re-examine the memory locations just to make sure it's not screwed up. It is screwed up, okay, fine. When I rerun the program, it reloaded everything from the executable itself, so the content of the, the array got reset. So I just have to set it back again to ABCD, uh, ABC and then a null terminator, and continue the execution of the program until it gets to the exit point. Now I'm at the exit point, print EBX, it is in fact three. So the program is doing what it is supposed to do now. Any questions? No? Want to do another one? Do you guys understand the general approach of doing it? You flatten the C program first. Do as much debugging as you possibly can in C first. And then once you cannot do anything else in C because you're ready to turn it into assembly, only then you start with the assembly program. Okay. Let's start another one. Okay, let's do another one. <coughs> we'll make it string copy, okay? Yeah, string copy is better than and string and copy because that will be too close to your homework assignment. This, this is close, but not exactly the same. So this time I'll use some string copy.c to you know, write the C code. Um, and I'll use the same thing here, argc. Uh, const char star star argv. So I use the command line to pass the string that I'm copying from, and the destination is a local buffer. So we'll just say char buffer as my destination. And we allocate 32 bytes to it, and then we say if argc is less than two, don't bother to do anything. Just get out. Otherwise, we'll do the rest. Okay. So the rest is we have um, a we need to have two string pointers in this case because we are copying a string so we need one source pointer and one destination pointer so we'll go ahead and create in one uh, source destination pointer and one source pointer since we are not changing the bytes in the source I make it a constant char pointer. So the pointer itself can change, but we cannot change what the pointer is pointing to. That's what char, uh, const char means. If I don't want to change the pointer itself, then it is char const and then uh, asterisk src, which means the pointer itself cannot change, but I can change whatever it points to. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, well that's uh, probably all that I need in this case. Um, so if the program does not exit at, at this point, I have a, an ARGV that can act as the source. So I would initialize the source to ARGV bracket one, which is the second argument on the command line, which is the string that I want to copy to my buffer. 
the destination is the beginning of the entire buffer, so I just refer to it as buffer itself. And now I can do the copying. The copying is not really too complicated. It's about the same as what we had before, the string length, except what we do inside the loop is slightly different. So in this case, we have um, as long as the source is still pointing to a non-null byte, do the following. What we want to do in the following is we don't need to no keep track of the length anymore. But on the other hand, we do have to copy uh, the source to the destination. Uh, let's see. do it like this. Do the copying anyway. And then inside, you know, if, if what I'm copying is a non-null byte, then we also want to increment. Okay. This is not a typo. I did not have a typo. It's not supposed to be equal equal. It really is supposed to be a single equal symbol, which means assignment in C. So I'll explain that later. So inside here, the only thing I need to do is to increment the destination pointer, increment the source pointer, and that's all I need to do. And at the end here, I have a return zero. Okay, so let me just go back and explain what this line is really doing. It is an assignment, okay? Assignment in C is an operator. It is not by itself a statement, okay? It is a statement once you have a semicolon at the end of the expression. So what I am really doing is to take whatever byte source is pointing to and update whatever destination is pointing to with that byte. That's the first thing I do. That's the assignment, you know, side effect of the assignment operator. But the assignment operator also returns the value of what is being copied. So the byte value that is being copied to the destination is also the result of the entire expression. So by putting that value inside the condition of a while loop, I'm basically saying, if I just copied a non-null character, do the body of the loop and then go back and test the condition again. So I'm relying on a, on a uh, side effect of the assignment operator to also do you know, the checking of what, what did I just copy. Did I copy a null character? If I did copy a null character, then the result of this expression is going to be 0. And 0 means false in C. Then it will get out of the loop and we'll get to the return statement. OK? Is that OK so far? Sort of? This is kind of like a good test of you know, how well you know C and C++. And that's why it's a prerequisite to this class. Okay. So we'll test this program first to make sure that it does work. Okay? And then we'll convert it step by step to assembly code. Okay. I don't know if you want to include the Oh, right. The head file because of the exit. is um, GCC would probably be complained about this. Uh, damn, take dash G, dash O, string, copy, string, copy, by C. And it's complaining. Suggest parentheses <coughs> around assignment used as true, false, truth value. Okay. Okay, this is, this is really great because when you use GCC, you should definitely turn on warn all because it will give you a warning like this. Because in most cases, when there's something that looks like this as the condition of a loop or as the condition of a conditional statement, it is usually a typo, okay? Somebody actually meant equal, equal, the comparison, okay? But in this case, I really meant to do the assignment. So to emphasize, I'm actually doing the assignment, and this is not meant to be a, a equality comparison. Um, GCC complains about it and say, OK, Tech, if you really know that what you're doing, tell me that you know what you're doing. So it wants me to put this in parentheses and actually compare this to non-zero, which does exactly the same thing. But this makes GCC happy. Okay? So GCC, with the warn all you know, option, it's basically saying, okay, you know, if you really know what you're doing, this is the way to shut me up and say, okay, GCC, I know what I'm doing. Don't complain about this anymore. Is that okay? All right. So we'll go ahead 
and recompile the program, even though it was just a warning, I want to get rid of it, okay? And this time it does not complain because I have sufficiently shown GCC that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Which is a good thing. I mean, you know, you guys really need to turn on the warn all because how many people have been bitten by this one at least once? Twice, three times, and so on, okay, you know. And, and those are really bad errors because, you know, not only is your program not doing what it's supposed to, it also has the side effect of changing a variable when it's only supposed to be comparing. So by the time you get to a point where your program will start to break or do something that it's, it's not supposed to do, then you will find out that, hey, how come this variable is now changed? But that's not, it's not supposed to be, it's not supposed to be changed. And it's because you know, of the use of the assignment operation instead of the comparison operation. All right, so we'll g use GDB to test the program, screen copy. Uh, we'll list the program, put a breakpoint on line 18, and I'll run the program with uh, ABCDE, okay? So by this time, buffer should have ABCDE in it, you know, including the node terminator. So we'll say print uh, buffer, and sure enough, buffer has ABCDE, and the node character here, okay? The node character was not there to begin with, okay? It was actually somewhat random before, but after the copy, it copied A, B, C, D, E plus the node terminator. Okay, so the program is working. Now is a good time to uh, flatten the program, okay? So to flatten the program, before we do that, we copy the good version of this program to string copy 1.c, and then we make changes to string copy.c itself. And using the same technique as last time, we'll use um, a pound if zero to basically comment out the code that we are replacing, and then use the else to state where's the beginning of the code to replace it, the flattened version of this code. So the first flattening attempt is to say, okay, here's the beginning of the loop, so we say while begin, and here's the end of the loop, while end. At the beginning of the loop, uh, we just have a conditional statement, so I'm going to use the opposite of this condition to decide when to get out. Because this condition here is telling me when to stay in the loop. So in order to get out of the loop, I have to look for the opposite of this. So the opposite of this, I'm just combining two steps into one at this point. The opposite of this is to say, oh, you know what? What I just copied was a null terminator. So in the case of that, I need to get out. So I need to go to while end in this case. <coughs> In the loop itself, at the end of the loop, I have to do an unconditional branch back to the beginning of the loop. In between, I can now specify the actual code of incrementing destination and incrementing source. So destination plus plus can also be written as destination plus equal to one. Source plus plus is the same as source plus, or e plus equal to one. And that should be it, okay? But I'm gonna test it first. So this is what I recommend you guys to do too, is to change the code, flatten it in C first, test the program, make sure that <coughs> each time you flatten it a little bit, it still works before you move on to the next step. Okay. So we compile the program, we GDB the program. Um, put a breakpoint on line 27, run the program, oops. Uh, well, what should be copied this time? I just ran it without the command line, without a, an option. Well, buffer bracket zero should be a zero, right? Because it's copying at least the zero itself. Actually, no, I take it back because I did not supply any arguments. It actually exit because of exit one. So let's run it with A, B, C, D, E. Uh, print buffer. It does have A, B, C, D, E plus the null terminator here. So it, it, it still works just the same as before, even though the program is now kind of flattened. Okay, so it is, we're almost done. We are not quite done yet because this is actually pretty complex to specify in uh, assembly. So in assembly, there are, mm, okay, so in assembly, I cannot do it in one single step because there's no way to combine a com comparison to an, uh, to an assignment. So I'm gonna break this up into two steps this time. So the first step is to do the uh, copy, which is the assignment operation. And then the second step is to ask the question, oh, by the way, what did I just copy? 
Is that okay? Because the, the copying part is not conditional. It has to be done anyway. The comparison part has to come after that. So in this case, I'm really doing the same thing. I'm just you know, doing the copying first. And then I ask the question, oh, the thing that I just copied, was that a null terminator? If it is, if it was a null terminator, go to the end of this loop, because I'm done. So once again, you know, let's go ahead and double check this program. GCC again, GDB again, run the program with, you know, some, I uh, forgot to set the breakpoint. Put the breakpoint on line 28, run the program. No, run the program with arguments. Okay. And print buffer. This time we should have A, B, C, D, E, F, and an alternator, and it's there. Okay. So at this point, I'm ready to, um, convert the program into assembly because I have done everything that I could do in C and C++ already at this point. It's time to convert it. So I copy the C code into assembly code and go to the assembly source code and basically cut off everything that I don't need. Okay. I don't have a main function anymore. Um, the original code, I don't really need it anymore because I have the flattened version already and it's proven to be working, so that's good. So now what is left to do is for me to comment every single line so that the C code is not there anymore or will be ignored by the assembler. <coughs> I need a dot data section just to, so that I have the buffer. Dot fill exactly you know, 32 because I need to allocate 32 bytes for the buffer. Uh, and once again, the destination and the source, I don't really need those to be variables because I have enough registers to play with. If I do not have enough registers to play with, then I will also need to allocate for destination and source, and then I have to swap a lot of stuff between you know, the memory locations and the registers. Okay? And that's when you know, the direct operand can come in handy. But in this case, I still do not need it, so I'm not going to do that part. Um, then I switch back to the dot .text section, dot .global underscore start, underscore start starts here. I can't really check the argument. That's not the, how this program is going to work. So this part is, I'm just going to comment it out because it's not important. The source is still, um, oh, I need to specify a source. Where to copy from? So I'm going to specify a source here. So, so I will use string one. And once again, I'll just use dot field 32 so it resembles your homework assignment. So I will say move L. Uh, dollar string one into percent eax, and I read a little comment here and say eax is my source pointer. Move l buffer to ebx. Ebx is my destination. Okay, so just just to move the comments around a little bit so it matches. While begin can stay the way it is. While end can stay the way it is. Go to has to be changed to jmp. Um, okay, so first thing, you know, how do we, how do we convert this line? It would be nice if we can do something like this. Okay, move. Are we moving byte or long? We're moving byte because we are moving whatever the pointers are pointing to, and not the pointers themselves. So we are moving byte in this case. It would be nice if we can say um, copy whatever source has. That source is EAX to the destination, which is whatever EBX points to. It would be nice if we can do this, but we cannot, okay? So I'm gonna leave it the way it is and, and let the co assembler complain about it so that you guys know what kind of error message you will get when you try to have two memory operands on the same instruction. Because it would be nice that we can do that. The next one is compare byte because we're comparing zero to whatever destination is pointing to. My destination pointer is EBX, so that's what I'm comparing to move this up here. Um, if it is zero, we want to get out. We want to get to end while, uh, while end. If not, we want to increment destination, which is add L dollar one to the destination pointer. Um, how come I'm using add L in this case instead of add byte in this case? What is EBX? 32-bit register. Is a 32-bit register but what is the role of the of EBX? It's a pointer, right? And the pointer is 32-bit. 
So that's why when I'm adding to the pointer, I'm using add long. When I'm comparing what it points to, I'm using compare byte. So you gotta make sure that you observe all these little differences. Because if you use um, compare long instead of compare byte here, it's not gonna work. Because it will, it will be comparing not just the byte that you intend to compare, but also three additional bytes. And that's why it, that will screw up the program. Okay. I'm adding one to the source pointer, which is my EAX. And that should be the code. All right. It's not going to assemble because I have two memory operands on the move by instruction. But I want to show you what it looks like you know, when we try to assemble a program like this. That's why I left the program you know, the way it was. And it complains about it. On line 18, we have two memory, memory op references for move instruction. You can only have up to one memory reference with the move instruction. So that's why we have this little problem here. Now it's time to go back to the program, go to line 18 and say, mm, we can't you know, move a byte from memory to another location in memory. So what we need to do is to use a temporary register as the intermediate thing and then copy it. It will copy whatever EBX points to, to a A-bit register and then copy from the A-bit register to whatever EBX, point, EBX points to. Yep. Like it's, it's like a swap? Um, it's not exactly a swap, it's just that you know, it, this is purely a limitation of what we can do with the instructions. So, um, so we have to separate it into two instructions. So the first step is to copy it to, um, let's say, BL. Okay. We cannot do it to AL because EAX, the entire thing, is still useful. And if you copy this to AL, it will destroy the least significant A bits of EAX. So we have to use, um, not B, CL, not B, because EBX is also useful. And then the next one is to copy CL, which is an A bit register, to whatever the destination pointer EBX is pointing to. So now we have to separate it into two different uh, instructions. Now, quite obviously, in this case, I can also change whatever EBX points to, to CL, because they have exactly the same content. But I'm not going to make that change because you know, it's, there's no need to do it. Are there any questions about how I fixed that problem? Because some of you will encounter the problem. In your homework assignment, you have to compare what one pointer points to to whatever the other pointer points to. It's the same thing. Okay, in the compare instruction, you cannot have two indirect operands. So you have to move the byte into a a bit register and then compare the a bit register to whatever the other indirect operand is pointing to. Okay. <clears throat> so let's save it and test it again. So let's reassemble. This time it does not have any problem. Link the program, strcpy. Oh, that's the output, and here's the input. That's the program, and we'll put a breakpoint on. Let's see. Well, you, you can also put a breakpoint on a on a label, so I can put a breakpoint on while end as a label because that really is the end of the loop, and things should be copied properly at that point. Okay, um, and then before we run the program, we also have to set a breakpoint at the beginning of the loop, which is on line 16 line 16 um, and then we can run the program once it stops at line 16 now is a good time to change the memory content because I have not set str1 to the source to actually give me some content to copy so it's now is a good time to do it so this time I'm going to try to use the uh, the more tedious way to do it which is what I have also written in my notes so we cast str1 to a char pointer and plus zero, which means you know exactly where str1 is, we want that to be the character lowercase a. The next one is going to be the character, oops. The next one is character b, and then the next one is character c, oops, ah. and then the null terminator. The null terminator really does not need to be specified because it is always there with, because of the dot field, but I'm going to do it anyway just to be sure. Now we can examine four bytes in characters at whatever str1 is located and double check to make sure that we do have lowercase a, b, c, and a null terminator. Okay, so my source is all set up. Let's double check the destination. The destination is really just buffer and it's all empty at this point, which is good. 
Okay, so now we can double check and see whether the code is actually doing the copying or not. So with a continue, I continue the execution of the program at full speed until we get to the next breakpoint. And here's the next breakpoint. The program did not do a segmentation fault, which is good, uh, which is the beginning of the loop. Okay, this is the second time we get back on at this point. So I should have copied one byte already. Is that making any sense? Okay. So let's check it, right? So let's look at str1 and oh, that's the buffer. Sorry. So buffer does have one byte copied. If I continue execution, it will go through another iteration of the loop, come back to this line, and now if I re-examine buffer, it has two bytes copied. So this way, I can just debug my program step by step. Double check you know, the third byte is now copied, and if I continue here. Um, what do you think it should do? I have already copied A, B, C, okay? And if I continue execution right now, what should it do? It will exit. Because the, it actually has not copied the no terminator, so it would actually go, through. C. it has just copied C, so it would go through one more iteration, but will come back to this point to copy the null terminator. So if by continue, it will go back to line 18. Nope, I got it wrong. It got to the, uh, the other breakpoint. Let me list the program again. Line 18 is here. It has just copied. Oh, okay, it copied the C in the previous iteration, so it's already pointing to the null terminator this time, and that's why the loop exited. All right, so are there any questions about the process? No questions? Does everybody know how to flatten a program? Okay. Uh, do it in C first, because it's easier to debug a program when it is still in C. Once you have got, got it done to the point where you cannot do any more conversion, then it's time to you know, convert it into assembly. Questions? No questions? We have exactly one week to, you know, to, to the due date of this homework assignment. I would start on this one earlier. Okay? This is not the same as the previous type of homework assignments. This one will take time. Okay. Um, some of you will probably encounter problems with segmentation faults because we have indirect operands. What do you do when you have a segmentation fault? Exit. Yeah. Sorry? Just lose my money. <laughs> when you have, okay, what can cause a segmentation fault? At this point of this class, what is the only reason you can get a segment segmentation fault? The indirect operand is the only reason you can get a segmentation fault. So the nice thing is when you're in GDB, the segmentation fault will actually let you stay in the program, okay? And it will tell you which instruction is causing the problem, okay? That is a good clue, okay? So you basically say, okay, which instruction is causing this problem? Now when you locate that line of code, which GDB will show anyway, um, indirect operand always involves a Register, okay. So when you have a segmentation fault, it is because of indirect operand. What you need to do is to examine the register and see what kind of value is in the register. If the register has some kind of really wacky value, that means for whatever reason it is it was not either initialized correctly or for whatever reason someone put something that is unreasonable into the register. Okay. Um, what you should see, okay, so if I, if I just run this program again and you know, put a breakpoint here, uh, you should see something like this, okay, or if you print it in hexadecimal, this is a reasonable value in a indirect operand as a register. This would be a reasonable value. So, I mean, yours is gonna be, it's not going to be the same as this, okay, but the range would be about the same. It should start with 8, eight zero four blah, 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 blah and it should be a seven digit number, the, uh, the eighth digit is implicitly a zero, okay? 
So if the value of a register is completely off by the time you get to an incorrect operand like this one, that means you're not using the register correctly. Okay. Are there any questions about this part? No questions? Okay. Um, as also another thing that you might consider doing is to redo what I just did today. Okay. Do not just watch the whole thing. Um, go from the C code and on your own come up with the assembly code. Because in this case, you know, we have the full solution already. So if you do it on your own and you, you get to a certain point, it's like, okay, I have no idea how to proceed at this point, you can actually go back to the video and know exactly how I proceeded from that point on in the class. So I would use that as kind of like a training step, okay? Even though it seems like a waste of time, I don't think it is. Um, unless you have a photographic memory and you can remember exactly what I did and how I do it in class, it is probably not a bad you know, exercise to do. Just to do it once by hand, you know, just look at the C code and say, okay, now I'm converting this into assembly code myself. And if you can get a process done, then you know enough you know, to start to work on the homework assignment. Because the homework assignment is a little bit more complex because it has more conditions and stuff to deal with. Any other questions? I would definitely start on this one early because you know we have next class for you guys to ask questions. So if you start now, um, we have you know, Thursday to answer questions. So we, we, that would be good. That would be useful. Any questions? No? Okay. I'll be at the lab later in 10 minutes. So for those of you who want to work on this in the lab, I'll be there. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>